This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number four, James chapter one, Trials and True Religion. Hi, my name is Herb Bateman, and we're continuing our series on the general letters. If you recall, the first uh, session we had, we talked about uh, historical backgrounds. And we focused on the fact that the general letters are written during a period of time in which the uh, uh, Greco-Roman world was uh, in play. Uh, so uh, James is writing uh, in a culture uh, that is um, pretty attuned to um, wisdom. Uh, to, uh, you have Epicureans, you've got Stoics, you've got... Uh, uh, wisdom within the, the Greco-Roman world that is uh, floating around that is um, uh, that has its, um, its undergirdings, its foundations in Greek philosophy or or Greek culture. Um, but we don't want to confuse uh, what's happening within the Greco-Roman world with what um, and where James is coming from. James's approach to wisdom is very Jewish. Um, in its background. In fact, if you were to look at um, uh, uh, wisdom throughout Judea, um, James has a lot of parallels with the Qumran scrolls. Um, if you were poor, in, uh, in one scroll we read, if you were poor, do not long for anything but your inheritance, and do not get consumed by it, lest you displace your boundary. James somewhat echoes that uh, perspective. Beloved, do not grumble against one another so that you may not be judged. See, the judge is standing at the door. So there's some parallels going on between what a Qumran author and how he's understanding certain things as, as it pertains to living wisely to what you see in the book of James. Similarly, uh, you'll see some w wisdom um, parallels in Sirach uh, when compared to uh, statements in James. Sirach 5.11, be quick to hear, but deliberate in answering. That's Sirach 5.11. But James 1.19 says, let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Similarly, in Sirach 29.10, lose your silver for the sake of a brother or a friend, and do not let it rust under a stone and be lost. James 5, 3 says, your gold and silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you. It will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have hoarded treasure. So you see parallels. You see wisdom paralleling uh, within other Jewish works and all of these um, uh, examples are available or uh, evidenced in my uh, book entitled Interpreting the General Letters. And it's under the historical background section that I bring some of these things out. So I think it's important as we think about James and uh, the theological thrust of James, which we've already mentioned as being um, a focus on living wisely without impartiality with other believers. Uh, that that foundation, that theological emphasis, doesn't have its roots in Greco-Roman thought. Its roots are clearly Jewish. And so this is, a, this is very much a, a Jewish text written for Jewish believers. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and uh, enter into a um, uh, reading of James, or working our way through James. And uh, we want to try to get through chapter 1 of James in this session. And I'm going to begin by reading verse 1 of chapter 1 in James. Now, the Bible I'm going to use and read from is the Net Bible. It's the New English Translation. Um, it has been uh, translated. Most of the men are, and women that are involved in this production are Dallas uh, um, associates, whether they be faculty or alumni of the school, but this is a, this is a uh, new English translation. It's available on the internet for free. 
uh, if you wanted to download it. But that'll be the translation I'll be using. So we have this verse 1, this opening introduction from James. There's your salutation, if you remember our discussion on genre uh, uh, two lectures ago. From James, a slave of God and of Jesus Christ, or Jesus who is the Christ, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad greetings. So we have our open salutation. James identifies himself as the sender, and he qualifies the type of sender that he is. He's a slave, and he's a slave of God and of Jesus, whom he has deemed his Messiah, uh, God's messianic son of promise. And once again, uh, you know, some of our translations may read bondservant, some of them may read servant, but I really, the, the word is doulos, the Greek word is doulos, and it means slave. A slave who has no rights, who's totally obligated, totally committed to his master. And James sees his master as being God and Jesus, who is God's messianic son of promise. The recipients of this letter are the 12 tribes um, dispersed abroad. Um, typically, uh, it's understood that these 12 tribes are um, Jewish Christians of the diaspora, and um, they were living outside the geographical area of Judea. Um, they could be as far away as Spain, they could be as close as Egypt and Syria, but these are Jewish um, believers who are living through the Greco-Roman Empire. Now, one of the things that um, um, I wish to identify is that uh, I think James is writing during a period of time uh, somewhere between 45 and 49. Um, so we need to ask historically, what's happening in the Greco-Roman world? What might have triggered this, this need to um, uh, write this work? Well, the emperor at this time is uh, a fellow by the name of Claudius. Now, um, I, I, I love history, so I, I usually um, buy a lot of books or have in the past uh, bought books and part and um, of a um, historical club, historically a historical uh, book club. And so they'd send me these books on a regular basis. And while I was a member of that club, um, I bought this work, um, a chronicle of the Roman emperors, the reign by reign record of the rulers of imperial Rome. And it's a nice summary, it's a nice uh, encyclopedia type book that you can go to and find information quickly about an emperor. And so in, 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 in preparation for um, this video, uh, I quickly just looked up about Claudius and his reign naturally is between 41 and 54. So in that time frame when James is writing, um, he, um, uh, he pretty much became emperor uh, by default, because the, um, the uh, Praetorian Guard killed his, the previous Caesar, and, um, and, and it's only by his playing stupid and dumb that uh, he was even spared, his life was even spared while Cla uh, 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 Claudius, uh, not Claudius, um, uh, Caliglia was uh, emperor. Um, so we're, we're, we have Claudius as the emperor of Rome. And one of the things that Claudius did during his reign was he expelled all the Jews from Rome. Uh, that's one of the reasons why when Paul goes to Corinth, Aquila and Priscilla are there. Aquila and Priscilla are from Rome, but they've been expelled from Rome. They became the scapegoats for um, uh, famine and some uh, discord within the, within, uh, in Rome. Is it possible that James is responding to um, this historical event or some other historic event? You, we need to ask ourselves, why might he be writing this? Perhaps the, that's the reason. We really don't know, um, but it's a thought to ponder. 
Another thing that, to keep in mind is uh, when we think about who's ruling what, um, having established the fact that Claudius is the ruler of the Greco-Roman world at this time, um, it's also helpful um, to keep in mind that um, the king of Judea is no longer Herod the Great. It's no longer his sons, Philip, Antipas, and Archelaus. They are long since gone. Matter of fact, during the time of uh, Caligula, when he was uh, uh, Caesar over the Greco-Roman world, prior to Claudius, um, he put Agrippa I to be ruler over the Judea territory. So um, Agrippa I is um, the grandson of Herod the Great. And Agrippa I has bloodline and ties I'll throw this name out at you, the Hasmoneans. Do you remember who they were? Judas Maccabee, Jonathan, Simon, John Hyrcanus, uh, Aristobulus, um, and Alexander Janus. They are the Hasmonean rulers that uh, freed themselves from the Greeks and expanded uh, Judea from the little area from in Judah to the to the expense expanse that it was when Herod inherits or gains control of Judea. Agrippa the sec, Agrippa the first is a grandson of Herod and has bloodline to the Hasmoneans. And of course, uh, uh, we read about Agrippa in um, in Acts, especially during the early beginnings of the church. So. Uh, once again, trying to keep things in perspective, we have Claudius, who is the emperor of the Greco-Roman world, and we have Agrippa I, the grandson of Herod the Great, ruling over Judea at this time. Um, so that's a little bit background information as we think about uh, the times in which J uh, James is writing. Um, as we've already noticed, his greeting is very straightforward. Greetings. He just sticks to the script, sticks to what's very common um, to his day. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about um, this next section, uh, verses um, 2 to 27, uh, the, the rest of this chapter. And um, this chapter has to do with trials and true religion, trials and true religion. And I break this out into um, three sections. And the first section that we're going to look at are, is found in verses 2 to 11, or 2 to 12, pardon me. And uh, we might say that the focus of James at this point is the value of trials. Or uh, we might put it this way, um, a little bit more um, positively, uh, a little bit, flesh it out a little bit. Trials in a believer's life are an opportunity. At which point you might say, yeah, right. But nevertheless, let's look to see what the text says. Let's, let's, um, let's see with uh, how, how James is seeing how trials in, in a believer's life could be seen as an opportunity. So let's go ahead and look at verse, verse 2. He writes, My brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials. Now I know some of your Bibles may just say brothers. Uh, the Net Bible translates this as brothers and sisters. Uh, but the word adelphos is a, a neutral word. It's a broad meaning word and depending on context, it can, it can be limited to uh, men or uh, physical brothers, a brother to brother. But in this particular case, writing to a community, um, brothers and sisters has a broader sense. Brothers has a broader sense to include a men and women. And so, uh, um, so it, it's, uh, it seems right to, um, 
to consider this use as being very broad. And we're going to find in later on in James, he'll use the word man, an heir, as being uh, very broad, uh, referring to both men and women as well. So we'll come to that uh, later on. Um, so, brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials. Now, the word trial, um, it's all sorts of trials. Um, they could be external trials. Could be something that um, could be uh, the trial that comes when your home is blown away because of a, a tornado. It could be a trial that, uh, uh, an external trial as a result of a hurricane. Uh, it could be a, um, a trial that could come because there's so much snow on your roof, your roof clave, caves in. Now, there are external trials of weather oriented that uh, you've got no control over, but it's a trial. Um, it could be an external trial uh, that might be leveled and, uh, upon you because of another person. Uh, um, let's just face it, not everybody's nice like me. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Depends on, it, uh, depends on who, you, who you talk to, right? I mean, we rub each other the wrong ways at times. I just so happen to be an extrovert. Well, introverts typically don't like me. They need more space. I start using my arms and flailing around and they start backing up because I'm in their private zone. You know, so, you know, so some things, you know, external trials, introverts with extroverts, extroverts with introverts, introverts, why don't, you know, extrovert says, why aren't you talking to me? Tell me what you think. An extrovert is just putting it out there on the table and he's out there processing. These type of, they're trials. And, uh, and so how do we get along with one another? Um, Sometimes trials are come because you, the person is just a jerk. How, and then that person becomes a trial. Um, these are external things. Um, internal trials. Well, I, I've already mentioned in some sense being an extrovert or an introvert, that's just who you are as a person. Um, could be internal trials of illness that you're wrestling with. Um, you find out you've got cancer, and, and that's a trial. Um, your son is deployed to Afghanistan. The internal struggles of concern and safety. Uh, and I shouldn't just limit that to son. It could be your daughter. Um, and so events that cause internal trials, they are, they're things that we wrestle with. They're things that we, we come, we, we've got to rob, uh, wrestle with. And, and so James is saying to us that consider nothing but joy when you fall into these sorts of trials. Um, now I have to confess that um, there's a difference between joy and happiness. And I think as we, we talk a little bit more, we'll, we'll discuss this. Um, going through a trial, um, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to be sing a, singing a happy song, but can I find joy in the fact that this trial um, uh, that I'm going through, uh, can I find joy in it? And, and we'll, we'll move along. Um, he, he says he wants us to have joy, and he gives us the reason why. And here's the reason. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So we're to have joy because the, re the, the reason for having joy is because uh, it produces endurance. It affects our character. God will bring every, every believer into uh, maturity because of trials. And I think one of the things that... Um, is helpful, and I, I know I'm going to come back to this later on, is just recognizing who we are in Jesus. It's very easy to be very consumed with our own little universe. 
my family, my own universe, my, my job, my own universe. But there's something bigger here than our little universe. Um, we are members of God's kingdom. Remember when we were talking about theology of the general letters? We need to look at these general letters as they fit into God's big picture. And God is in the process of reestablishing his kingdom rule on earth and to redeem a people to enter into that kingdom. We are members of that kingdom. And so as we recognize that as members of the, God's kingdom, he is framing us and enabling us to um, be kingdom saints. And if we keep that perspective that whatever it is we're going through, whatever trial we're going through, find joy in it because it enables me to be better kingdom saint. I must move on. So the first thing, though, we need to look at is that um, trials are part of life, and trials are an opportunity for spiritual maturity, verses 2 to, two to 4. Uh, let me read verse 4. And let endurance have its perfect effect, so that, with this result, you will be perfect and complete, not deficient in anything. He moves on from um, uh, looking at uh, spiritual maturity to looking at trials as being an opportunity for wisdom, verses 5 through 8. And let me read those verses. But if anyone is deficient in wisdom, he should ask God, who gives all uh, generously and without reprimand, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed around by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, since he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. What James is explaining and talking about is divine wisdom. It's understanding God's wisdom in his big picture. It's in his wisdom that he has put together this program, and we have been brought into it. So if we lack wisdom as to how it is and why it is I'm going through this, ask yourself, how might this fit into his big picture rather than our little isolated world in which we live in? Wisdom is seeking life realistically, not from our perspective. from God's. It's his story. It's his kingdom. And we are part of it. And we need to ask in faith. Um, you know, this uh, God will do what he says he will do. Um, we are part of his kingdom program. Ask, how does this help me be a better kingdom saint? Whatever that trial might be. Perhaps it drives you to your knees. Total dependence, total trust in what it is that God is doing. Whatever, whatever that trial is, perhaps that trial is there to drive you to your knees. Maybe I've been in situations, horrendous situations, where I've prayed for protection day in and day out. Every morning, Lord, protect me from those who want to hurt me. Do you have people in your life that you feel threatened by? That you, you feel that, you know, sense of paranoia, always having to have to look over your shoulder? You pray, God, protect me today. It's a form of trusting God and knowing that he will protect us in the midst of our enemies. He is concerned about praying with a double mind, though. Uh, a double mind is someone who believes some of what God says, but not all of what God says. Do you really believe that God is in the process of reestablishing his kingdom rule on earth? Do you really believe that you are a member of that kingdom redeemed because of what his messianic son has done for you? Or do you believe it somewhat? 
See, a double-minded man says, I, I believe that, but I'm just not sure. I know we need to be sure. And we need to persevere in that believing faith because that believing faith and that trust is what's going to enable us to endure trials. Trials should be seen as an opportunity. If we ask God for wisdom to deal with trials, then God will give it. Next, we want to look at verses 9 through 11, where we see as trials are an opportunity for a proper view of wealth. Wow. Verse 9. Now, the believer of humble means should take tr pride in the high position but the rich person, pride should be in his humiliation. Why? Because he knows, because he will pass away like a, a wildflower in the meadow. Uh, for the sun rises with the heat and dries up the meadows, and the petal of the flower falls off, and its beauty is lost forever. So also the rich person, in the midst of his pursuits, will wither away. So here, uh, Jude is uh, Jude. James, the brother of Jude, <laughs> is arguing how uh, not only do we have to have a right perspective of God and our being part of his program, his kingdom program, and he, he allows these trials to come into being because it helps us be better kingdom saints. He wants us to keep in perspective, he wants us to keep in perspective. Um, our wealth for those who are poor and for those who are rich. Um, the poor believers uh, should derive joy from focusing their thinking on spiritual riches. Uh, this is one of the reasons I love um, um, Ephesians. It talks about uh, the riches that we have in Jesus, that God has lavished on us. Um, the riches of being a member of God's kingdom. Uh, the, the poor ought not to be consumed with what he doesn't have materially, but consumed with what he has spiritually as a member of God's kingdom. Likewise, the rich should recognize that all of their wealth is temporary. I mean, as a kingdom saint, um, when my time finally comes, um, I'm not going to be able to take anything with me. I mean, it's not like I'm going to be able to hop in my car and drive to heaven. Quite frankly, um, I have no idea where, where even that place is. You know, um, As I came into this world, so I'm going to leave it with nothing. Uh, my wife ain't going with me. Um, my family's not going with me. My friends aren't going with me. I'm, I'm going this alone. However, once I tr tr cross over into this place called heaven that eventually will be, uh, uh, I will be a member of an earthly kingdom with a resurrected body, um, I will be with my friends and I will be with my family who are followers of Jesus. Um, but what I have on this earth um, won't go with me. Um, so we need, to keep, um, we need to keep things in perspective when it comes to uh, our wealth. Um, we could lose it all. A hurricane could come and wipe it all out. Um, the stock market could drop and we can lose everything. Um, we could lose our job. Um, wealth is fleeting, um, and we may not always have it. So uh, the author of James is, keep your, your, your wealth in perspective. Because as he uses this metaphor, this proverb about uh, um, uh, the wildflower in a meadow, they come and go, um, so will our wealth. It can come and go. And then um, lastly in this section where trials in a believer's life are an opportunity, um, he talks about how trials are an opportunity for eternal reward in verse 12. 
Happy is the one who endures testing for this reason. When he is proven to be genuine, he will receive the crown of life that God promised to those who loved him. God loves us. Um, there are times we don't feel like he does because some of the things that perhaps we may go through, but he does love us. In much the same way as a parent loves a child and sometimes may need to um, um, enable, uh, let a child go through some rough times on his own in order to learn, uh, to, in order to become mature, um, there are times where I, as when I was raising my daughter, my daughter wanted to do certain things and I knew it wasn't a good idea, but I let her go through it and it was a trial for her. But she grew as a result of that trial. I think God does the same thing with us as his children. Sometimes we do things and he lets us do it and we create our own trial, but he does it so that we learn. Okay, so trials are meant to be uh, an opportunity in a believer's life. Next, we want to look at um, where trials come from, verses 13 through 18. Um, and so let's, let's go ahead and begin by looking at uh, verses 13 and 14 first, because uh, here James is dealing with the source of temptation. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Um, God is never the source of temptation. Um, he doesn't try to get us to sin uh, as a means of strengthening us spiritually. Uh, he himself is not given to temptation. Uh, he is totally separated from sin. So we can't blame God. I mean, I, I love the story of Adam and Eve. Well, you know, you go into the garden, you know, and, and, and uh, they can do anything they want in the garden except not eat from that, this one tree. And so, um, you know, we know what happens. Uh, uh, a serpent tempts, uh, tests uh, Eve and and Eve succumbs, and then Eve gives it to Adam, and Adam succumbs, and God comes walking in the desert, and he's calling for Adam and calling for Eve, and they're not responding. And finally, when they do respond, uh, they, Adam explains, and God says, well, why did you hide? Why didn't you come? And he says, well, uh, because we knew we were naked. And God asks him this question. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from that tree? And what did Adam say? Eve told me, <laughs> the woman you gave me, God, you, you gave me this woman. Shh, she gave it to me. The blame game. Um, James is telling us, um, don't blame God for our shortcomings. Um, verse 14 um, but each one is tempted when he's lured or enticed by his own desire. Some translations will say lust. I think it's important that we realize that in our cultural, and I realize that other uh, people may be watching this video that may not be Americans, but Americans tend to be um, overly sexed. So when they think about lust and physical desires, they automatically jump to the conclusion, oh, this has to do with sex. And everything has to do with sex and a perversion of sex. But in reality, um, we're not limited. This is, these desires are not limited to sexual desires. It could be desires of um, more wealth, the desire to want more wealth, the desire to have more material possessions. Um, I always liked, uh, you know, one of, one of my weaknesses was always uh, bookstores, going into the bookstore. You know, oh, I'd love to have that book. Oh, I'd love to have that book. Oh, man, that book would, I, that book could change my life. Uh, but after a while, you learn to uh, control that. And so I often saw going into bookstores, one of my weaknesses is being a, a way to control my lust. I could walk into the bookstore and perhaps desire, but not succumb to that desire. See, it's okay to have desires. 
But when those desires become uh, overly obsessive and taking control of your life and you succumb to them, that's what we're talking about here. So um, lust is, in, in this context, or these desires, is a desire to do, to have, to be something apart from God's will. Let's just think about wanting to be something other than who you are. Perhaps someone has written a book, and it's something you've always aspired to. And so you desire to have that opportunity or have a contract or be able to do that yourself. That's a, that can become an evil desire. Perhaps you're in a position and, and you're a student and you're working uh, as a um, custodian. But a fellow student of yours got a position as a teaching assistant. And so you desire his position. Uh, those, I mean, uh, and, and, and then you act out. Um, those, are, those are our desires. They're not God's. Don't blame God for your greed, whether it be for uh, a different position, whether it be for a different opportunity, whether it be for material possessions. Um, they're, they're desires that are coming from, from within us. Uh, temptation is not God's fault. It's oftentimes our fault. Um, let's look at verse 15. Then when desire conceives, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. Um, first, let me go back to 14. But each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own sins. Then when desire conceives, that is, as it takes possession of us, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. Do not be led astray, my dear brothers and sisters. All, uh, don't be led astray. Um, be in control of your desires, regardless of whatever they are. Be in control of your desires. Then he talks about the goodness of God in verses 16 to 18. Let me read those for us. Verses 16 to 18. Do not be led astray, my dear brothers and sisters. All generous giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or the slightest hint of change. By his sovereign plan, he gave us birth through the message of truth, that we would be a kind of first fruits of all created. Right back to first fruits of all created, a new created order. James wants his readers to be, no doubt, about God's purposes. Every act of giving of ourselves, of our money, whatever it might be, is a, is a reflection of God's goodness. Um, Self-denying, self-giving, just like Jesus was. Self-denying, self-giving. That's what we are to be. And, and when those type of things happen from a pure heart, that's God working in us and through us, being kingdom saints, the type of kingdom saints he wants us to be. Next, we want to look at the proper response to trials the proper response to trials. Um, now, verses 19 to 27 uh, can be divided into sections as well. Um, but uh, the central truth that I, I want to drive home here is that true believers hear God's word and live it out. They hear it and they do it. Let's look at uh, an improper response first. Tells us what an improper is and goes to proper. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. Let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Once again, I've already read this. This is not an unknown wisdom statement. We read it in Sirach. 
And so this was uh, a common understood uh, statement or wisdom saying uh, that Jews of the uh, Second Temple period, Jews during this time in which James is writing, knew and were aware of. Sirach was a very popular Jewish work. We, we, can, we can read it for ourselves in, in the Apocrypha. Uh, so uh, the idea is that they need to act in harmony with knowledge. Um, a normal response to trials is to speak out against it, to complain, to grumble, to gripe, uh, and then to get angry about it. Um, but what James is uh, advising is to remain silent. Um, to be calm and to um, think your way through the trial. Now, and then, you know, not to respond in anger. Now, I, I, I need to step back, and I know we're running out of time here, but um, I don't want to give the impression that a trial happens and then you don't, you just keep it all in. That is not healthy, and that is not what's being said here. But it's, a, it's something that becomes perpetual. You're in the middle of something, you can't get your head around it. For me as an extrovert, there's absolutely no way I'm going to keep it inside. I have to find a brother. I have to find a sister that I can go to and say, hey, here's what I'm going through. And be as objective about it as possible in your presentation. Maybe even be angry. Maybe even demonstrate being upset. But the process of working through that trial is what's important. And it's the outcome that's what's important. Now that doesn't mean that you may work your way through a trial in a difficult situation and then have a scar. I have a scar on my hand here that um, I got when I was a sales manager at a hardware store. I sliced uh, my, my uh, hand, the palm of my hand open with a, with a knife. And it's a, it's a good three inch scar. But it's, and it's healed. Um, that was quite a trial. That was quite an ordeal. Um, and I can see that scar. And, and there are times as I'm going through life, I'm coming up against a trial that I've already been through once before. It's still painful. It's like this scar. Every time I, every time I rub my hand over it, I can feel that. It tingles. It has a sensation. We may go through a difficult, type, tough situation. We may work our way through it. But that doesn't mean that tough situation may not be triggered later on in history because an event happens that triggers. And then you've got to work through it all again. Just because you work through a trial once, just because you work through a tough situation once, doesn't mean you've mastered it. It's like, it's like a scar. Things will trigger and you may have to work through the trial again. That's okay. But the result is what's important. Verse 21, the essential response. So put away all filth and evil access and humbly welcome the message implanted within you, which is able to save your souls. Now, to me, this is not an easy uh, verse um, to, uh, uh, to interpret. Um, in, in 121, um, so put away all filth, this Filthiness could be unclean behavior, could be um, uh, a filthy mouth, vulgar. Now, I want to differentiate vulgar between wordy dirds, four-letter wordy dirds, uh, but filthy mouth that is very vulgar. You can be very vulgar without saying that that has no four-letter word in it. We're talking about those type of things. Um, uh, things that might be carried over to your pre-conversion days. Uh, he wants us to put those things away. Um, and um, not let them creep into your life when you're going through trials. And then he talks about the proper response, verses 22 to 25. For he gazes at himself and then goes out and immediately forgets what sort of person he was. But the one who peers into perfect law of liberty and fixes his attention there and does not become an unforgetful listener, but one who lives it out, he will be blessed in what he does. Doing the word is what's important here. It's not just a matter of looking at a reflection and walking away and forgetting about it. It's a matter of living out 
what you are doing. Doing the word of God in this context means rejoicing in one's trials. We go through life, we face trials. Hearing God's will is good as far as it goes, but obedience must follow. We hear how we are supposed to live differently as kingdom saints. We are taught. We know. We are not of this world in the sense that um, uh, we are a new created order. We are, but, but we, are, we are part of this world. I mean, we, we, we live in this world, but we're to be, we are to live differently than, the, than those who don't know the messianic son of promise, our king, Jesus. What we know about Jesus should reflect the way in which we live for Jesus. Knowing his self-denying, self-giving, self-sacrificing mindset should become our mindset. We know that about Jesus. Do we live like Jesus? Do we reflect that aspect? Let's look at verses 26 to 27, because here we're talking about external uh, behaviors. Um, uh, believers must act on God's word, verses 26 through 27. If someone thinks he is religious yet does not bridle his tongue, uh-oh, and so deceives his heart, his religion is futile. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this. Already? Are you listening? Take care for orphans and widows in their misfortune and to keep oneself unsustained but unstained by the world. Now you think you're going to go for what? Watch what you say. But he changes this and shifts it, right? To the importance of caring for orphans and widows. Uh, in verse 26, religious, uh, when it talks about um, uh, uh, religious, someone who thinks he's religious, it refers to a person whose inner godly condition is manifested with his outward behind behavior. Among the Jews, uh, where, uh, James, to whom James is writing, original recipients of this letter, um, uh, viewed their going to the temple and going and honoring religious festivals. These were all things a religious person did. These were outward activities to demonstrate covenantal loyalty with Yahweh. But what James is concerned is not the outward practices, but the, the, uh, the, um, um, the, um, the ability of self-control the ability of not overreacting and acting like a pagan. And a lot of times, your heart conveys, uh, is conveyed by what you and how you say things. But he does demonstrate what true godliness is uh, by conduct and character, taking care of orphans and widows. Uh, it's a duty that lies close to the heart with God. God cares for those who can't care for themselves. I know we have, uh, in northern Indiana, there's this uh, program called BIGS. And my wife is involved in this program. She's been part of this for years. And she works with uh, um, a little guy who comes from a home. And uh, he, he was abused as a little, little child. Matter of fact, he was taken away from his, his parents because uh, he was um, malnutritious, he, he, they weren't feeding him, and it's, uh, it's resulted in some um, uh, developmental problems uh, uh, physically and mentally, um, but a great kid. Um, in this area alone, there are thousands of kids um, who've been neglected and need people to come alongside and say, I care about you. I love you. I, wanna, I want to do things with you. Um, big brothers and big sisters is one way that you can care for. Now, this fellow is not an orphan. He lives with his, his uncle. Um, he does see his mom 
But um, he lacks social skills, and he's lacking in, in um, education, and he needs help and uh, care. Uh, there, are, there are ways in which we can care for those um, that are in need of care. So as we think about James and these opening chapters, we must uh, uh, recognize that trials, uh, verses 1 through 12, are to be seen as life's opportunities. Um, we should also recognize that when trials come, verses 13 through 18, we don't blame God. Uh, for our own shortcomings. And then finally, when trials come, true believers hear God's word and live it out regardless of what's happening in our lives. I trust that this has been helpful to you and we look forward to our next session when we look at chapter two of James. Thank you. This is Dr. Herb Bateman in his instruction on the general letters. This is session number four, James chapter one, Trials and True Religion. <music>